Okay, so this, uh, this roundtable session is uh, presenting a little bit our, our big collaborative project, Scaling Advanced Methods for Biodiversity Assessment, SAMBA. Um, so what is SAMBA? Oh, there we go. Uh, SAMBA is a Norwegian Research Council funded project. Uh, and the main goal is to enhance EU and uh, research council projects by establishing a world-class educational and research exchange program between Norway and Brazil. So within this, we have research exchanges, workshops and courses with dual accreditation and internships at multiple postgraduate levels with links to industry. So at first, obviously, we're starting out with this as a, a sort of more internal uh, structure but we are gradually opening up for external partners to take part in training uh, workshops, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an extension of existing research collaborations between our two groups, which have been going on, ongoing for a number of years now. Yeah, uh, we had a Kapis Utforsk uh, project looking at transnational training in biodiversity metabarcoding pipelines. And we have a project in mining areas in Brazil and some other smaller projects looking at specific questions with um, different taxa. So the people involved in Samba, the main PIs uh, between Brazil and Norway, are uh, myself here in Brazil. So we've, we're based here in the Science Park of Guama in Belém. And we do various projects along the northern coast. We've got a project looking at uh, recovering eDNA of endangered sawfish. And that one involves our partners in, in Norway. Um, and then the Norwegian side is mainly focused traditionally on plant metabarcoding uh, and barcoding and uh, molecular identification um, and uh, methods development. Yeah. So Quentin is a postdoc at the University of Oslo and Hugo is research director now at the Natural History Museum at the University of Oslo. And this is the website for our, uh, the standalone website for the project and more information will be available there with time. So just introducing Samba, a lot of the questions we have are how we can scale up eDNA work. So, um, so we know that eDNA and metabarcoding approaches work, but we see variable results in the analyses in different environments with different patterns of diversity, different taxonomic groups, etc. So under, one of the big questions at the moment is understanding which samples and protocols work best for given ecological questions or uh, administrative questions. And there are various cost benefit ratios that are involved in this, comparing eDNA to existing collection methods. Um, but how do these cost benefit ratios change when we try to scale up throughput to be able to do eDNA at a larger scale? We also want to think about the utility of our data produced, the short term versus the long term. So I've come up with the three R's of eDNA. Um, is our data reliable? This is sort of quality control. Um, is it reanalyzable? So is it in a... Um, a format that will allow future reanalysis based on the type of data and the information that data contains. And this is not just the reusability. Reusability is basically a, a, a summary of the FAIR principle. Is the data findable, accessible, interoperable, i.e. in data formats that can be used in different systems, and reusable in terms of simple um, uh, availability in raw format. Yeah. So there are some also logical issues for scaling up analyses. Um, one thing is that the more steps any process has, the more chance you have of introducing error and bias in that system. So if we have eDNA protocols that involve multiple steps of PCR, et cetera, et cetera, then we end up seeing things like increased tag jumps in library preparation and, and issues like that. Um, then we also have changes in protocols when you try to automate. 
when you try to automate protocols using machines, you'll find that they, the protocol doesn't work quite the same way. Maybe you have a higher risk of contamination. Um, maybe you have some benefits as well, but there are, there are adaptations that need to be thought of when we try to produce high throughput systems. And then of course, we have to think about data management, analysis, and storage issues. What is the minimal format of raw data that can then be reused and reanalyzed by other people? Yeah, uh, This is the sort of thing that needs to go into to GenBank, but then can we produce um, standardized data that can be redone almost automatically using pipelines uh, and exported to existing biodiversity data systems like OBIS, GBIF, et cetera. Yeah. So those are the general concepts that we're trying to take on board and, and look at within the Samba project. Uh, obviously using specific eDNA projects and metabarcoding projects for taxonomic groups, et cetera, during this process. So I'm gonna focus now, I'll be the first of the three talks. I'm gonna focus a lot on the role of metabarcoding in eDNA in ecology. Um, then Quentin will talk about species specific approaches. And Hugo will then go on to a few more technical issues and the importance of these in relation to legislation, uh, trade, um, inspection, et cetera. Okay, so in, in ecology, our general aims are to try and provide presence, absence data and abundance data. We can get abundance data from eDNA, it's relative read abundance, um, but we need to be sure that we have comparative sampling effort if we want to do truly uh, ideal uh, ecological analyses. And so here's that, that reference that I was talking about earlier. Uh, how many replicates to accurately estimate fish biodiversity using eDNA on coral reefs? Uh, I should also reiterate that for many studies in ecology, within species variation can also be important. Some of these can be resolved with analytical issues in eDNA, but often we need to work in concert with uh, classical sampling. So things like length weight relationships in ecology, differences in juvenile versus adult tendencies uh, within populations, et cetera. So within the ecological questions, we have a lot of variation in what we are trying to ask. So a lot of work is looking at community composition changes in space and time. Um, so the granularity of the environment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We've got metapopulation analysis. We've got speciation patterns for ecological uh, evolutionary ecology. And we've got interactions as well. And what I really want to stress here is that sample design is key. So when you're trying to think about what you're going to be doing, you need to think about the power of your sample design and if it will actually answer the, the, the ecological question, given the quality of the data that you have. So in community change, there's obviously climate change. So more and more, we will see the demand for eDNA and metabarcoding in temporal series of data. Uh, we've got land use, land cover change. So this is the classic sort of human impacts, deforestation, regeneration, urbanization questions. And we've got regional point source impacts. Yeah, so the introduction of invasives and things like that. And there's a lot of work been done on um, how to model sampling strategies in river networks, uh, how the eDNA production occurs and, and where you will find eDNA in the system. Okay, so that's a very important aspect to look at. With metapopulation connectivity, we start to see metaphylogeography. Now, this is uh, something that, that particularly Owen Wangenstein and his group have been developing. And we start to see repeated patterns or similar patterns uh, in meta metagenomic data compared to classic uh, haplotype network analysis. And they've got a very nice paper here to denoise or to cluster. Uh, and the pipelines that can be optimized for the different questions. There. The question of speciation patterns doesn't at first appear to be something that you would look at with metabarcoding and eDNA. But when you do the metaphylogeography, you will find that you accumulate the same patterns over and over across many taxa. And that allows us to detect hybrid zone sources and sinks. 
to try and work out the pattern that is common across the whole biota and not just an ev individual event from one particular taxon. So this will occur more and more as we get trends in occurrence data from seasonal and long-term time series. Yeah. There are also the interactions. Um, so here we got we can look at co-occurrence exclusion patterns, and we can directly trace interactions between uh, predators and prey, parasites and their hosts, and pollinators. So you can see that this can be used. This can be um, effective in providing uh, barom uh, here a barometer of uh, anthropogenic pressure. Uh, you can see the effect of dietary niche partition, and you can find unexpected diversity. And this is something that we found in, in squid in southern Brazilian fisheries, that they're eating a lot more pelagic taxa. Uh, traditionally, people find the hard parts in the diet, and so they assume that all of the fish content is actually benthic demersal species. But actually, we found little sardines and, and really pelagic species in the diet of these squid. There are, of course, ecological analytical issues to remember. So yes, we're molecular biologists, but we need to have a good understanding of what the challenges are for the data that's going to be used in the ecological context. And here, the issues are to do with sensitivity, you know, how well you can find a sample in your uh, a signal in your sample, the specificity. And here the big question comes in terms of which markers you can use. Can they identify different species from each other and how that occurs? And then, of course, we have the effects of rare species in ecological analyses. Uh, this is a lot more complicated than you might think, because uh, you might think the rare species aren't important, but they can be very important. So sensitivity. You have to always ask yourself, what is the importance of this in my study? If I'm looking at invasive species and conservation target species, then sensitivity using a species specific approach is possibly the most important thing. So we'll see that a lot in Quentin's talk coming up in a second. Then we have to think about the removal of rare taxa from our abundance and presence data. This is part of the data cleaning process in our pipelines. And the influence of this can be quite considerable. And I recommend there's some nice work that's due to come out from people working in uh, trophic ecology of herbivores that shows how important some of these rare taxa can be functionally for the diet of these species and how this can change your interpretation of the ecological results if you exclude or don't exclude these, these species. Uh, we can also find that rare species um, effects can change depending on the approach we use. If we're doing meta barcoding and we have a dominant signal from something that's present uh, or because our primers uh, are, have a bias to sequencing a certain taxonomic group, then those rare species can be excluded from our analysis within the molecular procedure. So there are a lot of questions about the limit of detection for eDNA using these different approaches. Specificity is a big issue. Yeah, again, asking what is the importance of it in your study? There are issues with, the with hybrids, particularly when you're tracking invasive species. So there's a, um, a Twitter, uh, recent Twitter post here, uh, an environmental DNA optimist, but a cautionary case. They were using eDNA to track invasive crayfish, and they found that the invasive crayfish had native crayfish in mitochondrial DNA. So this mitochondrial switching uh, can be an issue depending on your question. And then of course, we have the question of uh, specificity in terms of which primers you use and can they really identify all of the true taxa? Yeah, uh, this is particularly important. Um, I personally am not a big fan of the short 12S sequences because I don't think they work in mega diverse systems. And I think we see this a little bit here in this case for cichlid fish in Tanganyika. And I think we're big, I've seen it in our data, unpublished data from the Amazon. Um, the CO1 primers in bulk samples uh, also may vary quite considerably. 
Um, and there are some, there's some nice work there by Vasco Elber and team. You have to think a little bit about the percentage of true taxa that you will find in your communities. For example, in fish communities, we have say 30 to 50 species in stream fish communities. How many of these are from the same genus and will or will not be identifiable using the marker that you're looking at? Yeah. Um, and then of course there are pseudogene effects. If we start to use ESV and ASV approaches, how much are we amplifying our estimates of diversity with, with copies, nuclear copies of mitochondrial genes, for example? The rare species effects can affect metrics, uh, our indices of biodiversity. So there are some solutions and lots of people are talking about the use of hill numbers to solve the problem. Uh, this solves the problem in terms of species richness or standard measures but then it doesn't take into consideration the functional or conservational importance of the rare species in our analyses. Uh, so it's important to reconsider uh, the value of these rare species for your interpretations. So some personal reflections. Um, if you have the money, then I would strongly recommend that you sequence at greater depth using shotgun approaches. Or if you really have to use a metabarcoding approach, use generic primers for as many tax as you really can, and then analyze the subgroups. There are certain cost benefits, economic cost benefits of doing this as well. So for those who aren't aware, you could probably have a look at Kelpie. There's the reference there. And if you are producing amplicons, then try to use primers that exclude or reduce bacterial signal free DNA sources. But if you're using bulk samples, then probably you can get away with the most generic primers you can use. And again, when targeting something specific, go for a species specific approach. All of this represents a spectrum. Yeah, so you have to really think about your question, your problem, and what you want to do with your data after you've produced it. So I'd like to say thank you, of course, to our team uh, at UFPR. Uh, the funding agency, the Research Council of Norway, uh, our postgraduate course staff and students, and the collaborators in the SAMBA project, and especially a shout out to Marcella, who's been an absolute star uh, as a research assistant to Hugo and, and helping to organize and get everything uh, really, really working very well. Uh, I would just like to add very quickly that I have a PhD position uh, that I can fill soon. If anyone is interested in PhD in this area, then please do get in touch. Okay. Uh, now we'll move on to Quentin. Yes, so let me share my screen. Um, can you see my screen right now? Yes. Me too. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, first, thanks for having me and for inv inviting me for this presentation. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Quentin Moviso. I'm a postdoc at uh, the University of Oslo, working with Hugo and Jonathan on various eDNA topics and other topics. And today I will talk about eDNA analysis for monitoring target taxa. So we'll actually present a part of the work I was collaborating with, with some colleagues from France, from the University of Poitiers and the Antilles University in Martinique. So first, a quick introduction. So as you know, we are in the middle of a sixth mass extension with a loss of biodiversity occurring rapidly, which is threatening ecosystem services and human well-being. So we have the urgent need to increase effort in species conservation, and can do that by increasing monitoring effort or increasing the efficiency of monitoring. So in that regard, eDNA-based detection has been proven to be an effective, reliable, and invasive method for assessing species present in aquatic systems. So there, is, there are two different approaches. So the metabarcoding, using generalist or group-specific parameters, so it's very useful to retrieve community composition or measure the biodiversity. But very often, end users or managers are interested in the species-specific approach 
because they only want to know the status of one species. Is it present or not? And sometimes they also want to have like a rough estimation of abundance data, which can be sometimes achievable with species-specific detection using digital PCR. And so today I will actually only talk about qPCR studies, not DDPCRs. But we talked about two case studies which were conducted on Martinique on two invasive species. So what is Martinique? So Martinique is a French volcanic island, which is a bit more than 1,100 square kilometers and belong to the lesser uh, Antilles in the Eastern Caribbean, like Atlantic Oceans. And this area is identified as a biodiversity hotspot. So it outgrew a large number of um, endemic species. And the Martinique hydrographic network is actually really vast. So we have a bit more than 70 rivers and all these rivers are fed by numerous tributaries and most of them are permanent. Okay, so actually we have a problem now in Martinique. So we have introduction of invasive species. And the problem is on this island, it often leads to an ecological disaster because they have a very significant negative impact on indigenous, indigenous communities and ecosystem. And that's even worse on island because this island are very sensitive due to the isolation. So the diffusion of only one invasive species can often lead to a decrease of biodiversity as a result of predation, food competition, or spread of pathogen. And in Martinique, we actually have the issue with two invasive species these days. So the invasive red claw crayfish, Carax quadri carcinatus, and the invasive catfish, uh, Hypostomus rubini. And so in Martinique, uh, a few years ago, I mean, a few years ago, we had a freshwater shrimp species, which was originally farmed on the island. But people had to stop farming this uh, freshwater shrimp due to various issues. So someone, someone had the brilliant idea to actually import these crayfish species to replace them for the farming. And this crayfish is actually native from Australia and Papua New Guinea, and it was imported in 2004. So obviously, very soon after importation, this species uh, escaped from farming ponds or was actually released in the wild through uh, human activities and was quickly established itself due to its, to, due to its ease of breeding very fast growth rates and high tolerance regarding water quality. And that's a very important issue as invasive crayfish are known to affect the trophic chain and modify their environment due to their opportunistic and omnivorous behaviors. And also in Martinique, there is another concern. So Martinique is actually widely contaminated by chlordecone. So chlordecone is one of the worst persistent organic pollutants which was used again a banana pest until early 1993. And this crayfish actually, the wild population of this crayfish are heavily um, contaminated by chlordecone. So people catching these species of crayfish in the wild and eating it uh, poison themselves. So that's a really big issue. And in 2015, the presence of this crayfish was observed in four sites using a traditional trapping. And in 2018, there was a large survey using baited traps, which confirmed the presence of this species in 10 new populations. But because this survey actually relied on traditional monitoring, such as echo fishing or baited camera trap, we know that we underestimated the true distribution of this species. And there is another issue, which is this fish species, so the invasive catfish. And during the second survey in Martinique, when we were looking for the species, uh, we found two populations of this invasive pleco, which was actually released in Martinique through a pet trade. So that's a very um, popular fish species in aquarist. They sell them with a very little, so like two or three centimeters. And when, after a while, when they grow, people actually put them back to the wild and they reach easily size of 30 centimeters or more. So that's also a very big concern for the traditional, I mean, for the endemic fauna and flora in aquatic system in Martinique. So we are following the first record of these fish species. Uh, we had to go uh, more to the wild and find if we could actually find them in more other locations. So for these two species, we investigated the use of eDNA detection using species specific approaches. And we follow this uh, very um, I mean, simple protocol. So first, we design specific, 
specific primer for both crayfish species and fish species, so like species specific primer for both species. And we validated in silico in vitro using uh, DNA and sequences from closely related co occurring species. So we wanted to be sure that we would only detect this invasive species. And uh, so we followed the MIQ guideline to assess the limit of detection and limit of quantification of the assay. And for the crayfish species, we also did a control mesocosm experiment before going for in situ validation. And the control mesocosm experiment allowed us to investigate potential correlation between eDNA detection and quantification related to various abundance on biomass and also determine, if the, uh, determine some uh, knowledge about eDNA persistence in water under controlled conditions. Then, after all this validation, we went to the wild and in Martinique and we investigated 83 locations spread over 53 rivers and ponds and also water bodies using eDNA. And we checked for crayfish and for plecot detection. And at each site, we took three water samples. And basically, water was filtered until the filter was clogged. So we had various volume. And each of these uh, natural replicates were analyzed in four technical replicates for the crayfish species and two technical replicates for the fish species. And I will talk a bit more about that later. And we also run some site occupancy modeling approach to assess effect of environmental covariate on the presence of the crayfish and on the presence of the fish to estimate the detection probability of the assay. And we also investigated the effect of several uh, covariates that we uh, took at the same time as the eDNA samples. So we investigated the effect of temperature, the volume of water filtered as a proxy for the turbidity. We also investigated pH, conductivity, oxygen concentration, and oxygen saturation. So first, some of the results for the mesocosm experiment for the crayfish. So we found that we found a significant influence of crayfish biomass on detection efficiency by PCR. So it's not shown here, but here we showed a decrease of the detection probability over time when the crayfish was removed across both treatment. So here and here, we had two different mesocosm of 30 liters. We had low crayfish abundance and higher crayfish abundance. We put them like, for a bit of time and we removed them and we saw how long the eDNA signal persists. And with low crayfish abundance, after 28 days, we couldn't detect anything. But with a medium crayfish abundance, we still had persistence of eDNA after 28 days after removal. So it gives us some knowledge about how long eDNA can persist in a control experiment. So it might be different to the wild because of the flow rate, because of bacterial activity, because of UV, because of a lot of variables. But that's really very important to have this type of knowledge. And also some more knowledge about influence of a replicate in the field. So we saw that um, if, we took, if we take only one biological replicate, only one water samples, if we analyze that with two technical replicates with qPCR, we have kind of a low detection efficiency. And it's getting higher if we do more technical replicates. But we also found that making, uh, taking a lot of biological replicates increase a lot of detection efficiency, even if we had then low, low number of technical replicates. And also something which was really interesting here, we you know, investigated the effect of volume of water filtered as a proxy for turbidity. And we found that the more water we filtered, the less likely we were to actually detect eDNA. So it was actually quite interesting and going uh, to the opposite of a lot of study published. And the hypothesis here is this crayfish disturb a lot the environment, so they make the water very turbid. So it's why we actually have a very high detection probability uh, when you filter the low volume of water because the crayfish makes the environment really turbid. So that was quite interesting. Observed. And some results about the crayfish detection in Martinique. So in 2015, using a traditional survey, the crayfish was found in four locations. So this uh, green spot is actually the farming uh, place when the crayfish um, were actually escaped or released from. So in 2018, we had four sites with a crayfish survey. In 18, we had uh, 10 sites, it looked like we had a bit more than 10 sites, but around 10 sites using a baited trap survey. 
and in 2019, following the EGN analysis of 47 sites, of uh, 83 sites, we found 47 new sites where the crayfish was occurring. And we confirmed the crayfish presence at 28 locations using traffic. So we had actually relatively high crayfish locations in these places. Uh, a uh, bit of data, a bit of a result related to the catfish detection. So in the same set of samples, we were able to detect this um, invasive catfish at 18 locations after the 83 surveyed. And out of this 18 location, we confirmed the presence of this fish in 14 sites using uh, traditional trapping, which is actually quite a lot for a survey conducted in 2019, only like one year after the first detection of this species in the wild. So it's already in 18 distinct locations, which makes us wonder how long this species has already been there, but actually was undetected. And so quite interesting is we found also the same um, um, observation of the effect of water uh, filtered for the indicated detection of this uh, fish compared to the crayfish. So the more water we filtered, the less likely we were to detect this fish. And again, we have the same hypothesis. This fish makes the water really, really turbid when they are wrong. It might explain why we have a better probability of detection when we have a low volume of water filter because it's very turbid. And that to give you an idea of how the site looks like, in the places where the EDNA survey was made. So it's a nice environment, a lot of vegetation, and really, really turbid water. And also quite uh, interesting to say is uh, both, we haven't found any other effect of the other covariates on the detection, the probability of detection for the crayfish and catfish, which is actually quite expected because both species show very high tolerance to various habitats. So you can basically survive in any place. And again, so now is the next step. So because we're able to go and do this survey on species specific approach, formatting invasive species. Now we are actually doing some work on formatting endemic and endangered aquatic species. So we're actually conducting that also with Hugo, and we'll submit an article very soon on it. And because now we have these DNA samples available, the next step is to do a metabacoding analysis to assess the full community composition. But we still need to do a bit more work on this because we don't have a very updated reference database from Artemic. So it's still a bit more work ongoing. And also now we are planning to do some um, gut analysis for the from the stomach content from both crayfish and plego to see what is the impact on the local fauna flora. And finally, I would like to thank all my colleagues, especially both uh, Thomas, so Thomas Boudry and Thomas Dilber, which were the main um, author and leaders of these two studies I presented on the crayfish and on the plego, and all of the, all of the colleagues, which helped a lot for this work. So thanks for listening to me. Excellent. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, now, Hugo will take us into the forensics aspect. Yes, I've just stopped sharing there. I need to share my own. Here we go. Look at that. Um, there we go. I will talk. Uh, I'll, I'll continue talking, uh, you know, following up on these two topics, but then um, I'll take a slightly different uh, approach because I'm going to be talking about um, uh, plants and how we can use uh, molecular approaches in authentication. So I think it's obvious for you already by attending this meeting that uh, that meta barcoding uh, is a very powerful method and that we can use it in many different ways. Of course, uh, many of the questions that we ask are, uh, are very sciencey related, but others are, uh, can also be more um, towards societal benefits. And one of these is, for example, authentication. So authentication is a bit of an umbrella term that overlaps the basic concept of, of barcoding, right, to be able to identify organisms from DNA. But authentication uh, is relevant uh, in, for example, detection of frauds, product quality, illegal wildlife trade, screening, 
monitoring and legislation. And um, it allows us to identify the unknown, right? From species in traditional medicine to illegal wildlife trade, as well as all the other examples that were given by Jonathan and uh, Quentin. Just uh, about the application of these methods to uh, herbal medicine, when people first started to apply DNA barcoding or you know, the good old Sanger based DNA barcoding, it was a real eye opener because uh, suddenly we realized that there was a lot of irregularities in commercial products around the world. So then obviously it wasn't then used specifically for authentication, but it showed the potential that uh, eDNA and also metabarcoding and DNA barcoding have for um, uh, authentication. Just to give you an example, just to give you an example uh, from a study that we did a few years ago on uh, a, a, a herbal product uh, made with uh, St. John's wort. Uh, and here we have to think of a herbal product, so little pills that come in a little jar. And each little pill we can see as an environmental DNA sample, right? So instead of, uh, instead of taking a water sample from Martinique or uh, studying uh, uh, a bulk sample of insects from, uh, from the Amazon, uh, each pill in a way is also a mixture of DNA from different organisms. So in this study, we looked at, uh, at 78 different uh, products that we could just source from the internet. And uh, you'd be surprised, but using a uh, simple DNA metabarcoding, we found uh, 218 different plant species in these 78 products. Um, surprisingly also, we found up to 19 uh, plant species per, on average per product. Uh, and the, the intended ingredient, this Hypericum St. John's worth was present in only 68% of the products. So that was quite, uh, quite disappointing uh, in a way, because it says a lot about the products. It also says maybe something about the detectability uh, that we use. Um, no products contain what's on the label. If, if I take a look with you, instead of having this, uh, this uh, very poor uh, resolution heat map on the background, if I take a look at a specific uh, product, such as uh, product number five, HO5 here. Uh, it's a tablet, it's sold as a food supplement. Uh, it gives us an insight into uh, read numbers, relative read abundances of each identified uh, OTU, right? And then if we try to relay that back to the product, we can have uh, the ingredient list that we have on the product, unlike, you know, uh, uh, an environmental sample from a river in Martinique or a bulk sample from the Amazon. Here we actually have a list of species that's supposed to be in there. Uh, we can check cross-reference whether things are absent or present. Um, so this, this shows some of the potential for this method. When we think of uh, authentication, we also have to think of, uh, of legislation because it has to do with, uh, with law, right? When we're talking about um about food or about medicine there's the, the you know for example in the us there's the food and drug uh administration uh the fda uh and i'm sure that there are in all uh, countries that we have there are authorities that uh, uh, help us to guarantee the quality of the food and medicine that we have also it's important to think of, uh, of CITES, you know, the Convention on International Trade in the Native Species of Plants and Animals. Um, and we have to think of uh, red lists. Um, legislation is all about species, right? Um, it is law is, you know, all laws are written uh, about species, not so much about ecosystems or biodiversity, in general term, terms, but it's very often uh, species-based. Um, what I was going to say in relation to that is then also when we're looking at applying metabarcoding or metagenomic approaches to, um, to authentication, then it's 
we need to be able to identify things at the species level. Having a rough molecular biodiversity assessment is, uh, is, can give us a good insight. It can be useful for many cases, but it's difficult to, to talk to policymakers uh, about molecular diversity. They often want to know how many red listed species are in the area and what can we do about that. So, um, as another example, uh, here I'd like to take up uh, orchids. Um, orchids are protected in many countries, and uh, all orchid species are, are included on the uh, CITES appendices either on Appendix 1 or Appendix 2, um, which means uh, that international trade in orchid species is regulated uh, and requires specific permits uh, in order to be transported from one country to another. In uh, this case study that I'm talking to you about now, we're studying terrestrial orchids, not Amazonian terrestrial orchids, but uh, it's a very, you know, it's a movable feast. You can apply this anywhere. Um, the orchids that I'm talking about are uh, terrestrial orchids uh, growing in, uh, in Turkey and in Iran. And these uh, orchids, they are collected by people. They like to eat the tubers of the orchids, what we see here on the left on the screen. These tubers, they are washed, they are dried, and then they're ground to a powder. And this powder is used to make uh, specific food, drinks, and also ice cream. On the little map in the center here, we can see how uh, orchids are collected in red in Iran, and then they are uh, exported to different countries, both to Pakistan and India, but a lot of it also through Iraq to Turkey and directly to Turkey. Um, why is this so? Well, over harvesting in Turkey means that it's very hard to find these orchids in Turkey, but people in Iran don't really uh, care much for these orchids. So it's a good place for traders to go and buy orchid tubers. You can imagine that we, when we look at these tubers on the left, they're very hard to identify. So in terms of authentication, we have an issue. If these tubers are crossing borders from one country to another, how can we identify what is there? We do know that if it is an orchid, then it is CITES appendix listed. If it is not an orchid, then it might not be. So that is the first question that we need to ask. And then from a conservation and from a scientific uh, viewpoint, of course, we also like to know how can we be sure that it's not one, that it's one species or the other, because we want to know which species are affected the most by illegal trade. Is it the most common species or are they the rare species? Well, using DNA barcoding, that question is easy to answer because we can take uh, all the orchid tubers that I'm holding in my hands there from a market in Iran, and each tuber individually we can identify. And we can place it in the exact genus and often also the exact species. When it comes to the powder that I refer to, which the powder is the the, are the species that the people buy. No, it's the product that people buy in the market, right? So you, you go to the market, you buy some orchid powder, and you make a hot drink or an ice cream out of that. Um, again, that is a DNA metabar coding question, because then the powder is our eDNA sample. That is our little ecosystem of different species. Um, using DNA metabar coding, we can identify uh, orchid species to species level. and as also mentioned by, by Quentin, we can get like a full biodiversity assessment from a, an approach like that. So we can immediately also identify what other plant species are in there. So using this approach, we can uh, find out which products contain orchids, which products are fraudulent and do not contain orchids. And we can also get an insight into the product quality from country to country, such as we see here on this map. We have samples from Iran, Turkey, Greece, from Germany, or from the Netherlands. Um, 
And for each of these uh, categories, and also each of these countries, we can use a meta bar coding approach uh, to authenticate products, yielding valuable information. Um, just a really short uh, follow up here is that these studies that I was just discussing, they use these common DNA barcoding markers for plants. I'm not sure if you're plant people, but plant people don't agree on what uh, DNA barcoding markers are good to use. They have, you know, tons of different ones and, uh, and none of these work for everything. So it's always about uh, picking and choosing based on maybe some more subjective feelings and more objective decisions. Um, so obviously, this type of uh, molecular identification, as we see for other organism groups, doesn't really work that well for plants. So for plants, I just want to mention this, uh, this different approach using genomic barcode, because um, it's a radically different approach. Uh, the one that I'm going to just show you a case of uses target capture enrichment. Uh, and one of the nice advantages here is that it allows uh, identification at species and population level. So for example, here we see this uh, slightly uh, confusing graph uh, from this uh, study that we published recently, but we can see that um, using traditional uh, plastid markers, we cannot really get uh, any relevant identifications for the genus that is studied here using uh, full ITS or using full plastome uh, sequences, we can get genus level identifications. Using these nuclear markers, we can get species as well as population level identifications. You know, that is a big difference, uh, being able to say that something is a specific family or being able to pinpoint a specific population somewhere on the map, uh, that is really important for authentication and for legislation. Um, so the example that I'm referring to here is, uh, again, not from the Amazon, but rather from uh, Northern Africa. Uh, it is a, uh, a plant species called Anacyclus pyretrum. We see a little picture here in the bottom left corner. It is collected there and then it gets traded all over the place. It goes to Nepal, it goes to India, it goes to Tanzania. Uh, a lot of uh, trade, a lot of threats to the species. So in this approach, uh, instead of using a, you know, like a Sanger-based approach in which we look at one marker, uh, we rather look at uh, 800 uh, markers. And we uh, sequence, we, we, we tease out and amplify DNA for these 800 markers, assemble them, make uh, you know, individual gene trees for each marker, and then we can make a consensus uh, tree that we can use as a reference for species placement. Um, so nice thing is these methods, they work really well for degraded DNA, which is typically the kind of stuff that you work with when you work in, uh, in, uh, in species authentication. If you're doing work for the customs or if you're doing work for the police, you always work with shit samples. Uh, also, a lot of museum collections aren't that great. So being able to work with degraded DNA is a real um, uh, advantage. Um, so a method like this allows us to uh, trace species through time and space. We can uh, go to specific marketplaces around the world, purchase samples there, and we can, uh, with the resolution that the marker yields, we can uh, get specific subspecies identifications um, for each and every sample. Uh, these samples here in the top right corner, maybe it's hidden behind the, uh, the person talking, but uh, that's what the samples look like. They're really hard to identify. Also, uh, and this is maybe, you know, this is the, the real amazing thing about it, is that we can get identifications of specific samples. A specific sample, such as in the top, uh, the, the, the top uh, two figures here, a specific sample that we buy in India, we can figure out that these samples occur in different marketplaces in Morocco and that they all originate from Algeria, two countries that are in a constant conflict with each other, which do not have open borders, 
apparently have a lively trade in this uh, illegally collected uh, plant, uh, passing through this porous border, going to bigger marketplaces in Morocco, and then uh, being uh, traded off to India. Uh, this is something that we were never able to do before. Obviously, this is not maybe meta barcoding per se, but this is genomic barcoding, uh, you know, at like 4K resolution. So this being able to trace populations through space and time is maybe not uh, the key thing of um, legislation, but it's key to uh, law enforcement. And that is where I wanted to kind of end my example with a few uh, reflections, just as Jonathan gave. Uh, so we have super barcoding approaches. We can use them for specific applications. In a way, uh, as also Jonathan was saying, that we have uh, you know meta barcoding moving into metagenomics and genome skimming. These are all approaches that are uh, yielding more and more data, which allow us to work at higher and higher resolutions. And um, obviously, a lot of these methods are costly at this time, uh, but not all methods need to be costly. I think this is something that Quentin showed very nicely, is that you know using the best method depends on the objective of your study. And some methods are cheap, other methods are expensive. It's good as a, as a final statement to bear in mind that if, if we want to provide a tool for law enforcement, then uh, we need to have a species and population level identification in many cases. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugo. So, um, we go into the question session. Uh, I hope we've managed to give a, an introduction to everyone of how the Samba project approaches eDNA and metabarcoding from multiple viewpoints and uh, how we're open to, to provide support and collaboration training where necessary. Yeah. Any questions? Jonathan, I'm not sure if you can see the question on the, our chat. I think from Mark Siqueira, yeah. He's talking about Kopi Luwak coffee. Also for mm -hmm. Whether or not we can check if they've been faked. Uh, I, I guess here we, we would be checking to see whether or not there are traces of the, um, the pine ferret, civet, pine civet that was digesting the coffee rather than origin of the coffee itself. Yeah, because it's very specific to that species of, of mammal that digests the coffee. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, sensitivity issue there, no. yeah, I would say. It's really, um... Uh, that's a bit tricky. Once it's roasted, of course, it's very difficult to get the DNA, especially maybe we would find some DNA, you know, of the coffee itself inside the coffee bean, but especially the surface would be roasted uh, sufficiently well, very far. If, I know that um, from colleagues in, in Vietnam, where they don't have the same kopi luak, but they do have a coffee which also passes through the intestinal system of a, of a weasel. Um, that in the marketplaces, they, they sell it unroasted uh, because it allows you to check the quality of the product before you buy it. And then you roast it yourself. So that would be, uh, we could be using um, meta barcoding to see what the host or DNA barcoding to see what the host is, that, you know, whether it passed through the creature or not. So there's a, a question from Victor about the approach, the genomic approach, sequencing approach for the genomic barcoding. Yes, um, Victor, that's a good question. Um, so in this, I, I had to, you know, um, mention that very um, briefly or superficially. What we do is um, we design uh, uh, baits that uh, target uh, genes 
in uh, in the genome in the nuclear uh, genome and um, this this short the short baits together they will uh, capture the entire um, gene of interest for the marker of interest sort of like a UCE meets a meta barcoding sample yeah it's very much it's UCE basically but then uh, um, yeah it's basically it's UCE based so ultra conserved elements but here we do not necessarily take these ultra conserved elements, but we take elements that, uh, or we take markers that have the right variation for our approach. But for plants, uh, you can also use a standard kit called the Angiosperm 353 kit, which is just um, kind of an off the shelf kit that you can buy and, and do your experiment with. It's much cheaper. I think there's a question to Quentin here about that data you showed us. The more you collect, more water you collect, the less chance you have less chance to get eDNA from that uh, record. Is that right? Is it the someone is asking here? I can't see the name. Is if is it if is it a inhibition effect or you know? What do you think? So, yeah, that's, that's, a bit, that's a bit of a weird result because if it was inhibition effect, we'd expect that uh, we would expect to have like a lower detection probability for the low volume of water collected, but you actually see the opposite. So, um, it's, I, I was yeah. suggesting maybe inhibition from the sediment that is co filtered with the, the sample. Yeah, but I mean, for all this water sample, uh, water was filtered until the filter was clogged. So we could expect the same level of inhibition everywhere. But in these cases, for both crayfish and pleco, we found that when we were able to filter a low uh, volume of water, we had a higher detection probability. And when we filtered a lot of water, we had a lower level of detection probability. So it's causing a bit, going a bit to the opposite of what most people found. And yes, the hypothesis right now is because um, both crayfish and pleco disturb a lot the environment, they make the water very turbid. So every time we go to a place when they are present, we are able to filter less water because they just make a mess of everything. We have a, a question from Carla uh, about greater depth of sequencing. How much sequence reads do you think is enough for a metabarcoding community monitoring per PCR sample? Uh, this is a tricky question because it's a sliding scale. Yeah, um, you have to understand the the dynamics of diversity that you want to look at in relation to the marker that you're using. So, if you're using generic CO1 primers and you're expecting to get from a bulk sample 400 species of insects, then your sequencing depth will be appropriate to that given a, a sort of Poisson distribution of, of relative abundance that you might expect within the, the population. Um, so you really need to sort of think about the sample in that respect, yeah? Uh, in eDNA, then it depends a lot on that interaction. If you are going to be using 12S, then you get very specific sequencing depth for the taxa that you're looking at for that primer set. If you're using a CO1 minibar, then you're going to get a certain percentage of bacterial signal. And if you're using 16S, you'll get a lot of bacterial signal. So your sequencing depth will depend exactly on what you want to pull out from the sample um, in, with respect to the, the question that you have. Yeah. Uh, Victor was also asking about the this genomic approach for mitochondrial genomes. It's a little bit different there. Um, this is what uh, I think is termed mitochondrial metagenomic approach. Uh, and there are enrichment protocols that you can use to pull out mito mitogenome sequences from a mixed uh, sample of mitochondrial and nuclear stuff. Um, so there are bait capture methods. I mean, there are even old traditional methods that, that work on um, other physical approaches and things as well. Okay. Okay. 
Any more questions? Hugo's putting a few links into the, the papers that are relevant. I have put in a link there for the PhD position that's available with us at the moment. If anyone's interested, then please do get in touch. Uh, we have a degree of flexibility in the project, so people can develop their own ideas, new methods, techniques. Okay, have we arrived at the end of the session, Daniel? We have time for a few more questions, but if, if you don't have any questions, I have a lot of, a lot of questions to do, but maybe it's, it's going to be better if, if I make them at the end of the second round table, then we can make a, my, my question is, I can do it right now. My question would be like, what, what do you think will need to make Metabar coding and metabar coding and eDNA you know, data available for uh, implementing a real monitoring system in Brazil. You know, make, making it useful to our our government to use in monitoring and environmental licensing as well. And companies can provide that data. Do you think that we are ready to go, or we still? have work to do, you know, on our side in the academic world. So yeah. I, I, my question would be, how, how, how close are we to transfer this knowledge to you know, the, the public to be used I think by the public? My personal view yeah. is that there are approaches that we can already implement. So when we're looking at um, approaches that do not require necessarily on having the complete taxonomic identity, so we're looking at diversity patterns and how that relates to change between impacted and non-impacted areas, control areas. Um, the species-specific approaches can definitely be applied. Yeah, this is, this is something that can always be applied because you just need to build up the species-specific uh, probes and it's part of each project. Um, and then depending on the taxonomic group, we're at different stages of, of application for the, the sort of more taxonomic uh, assignment approach. And that depends a lot on the region, the geographic region you're studying and the reference data that's known for those regions. Yeah, agree. Still have to develop, develop a better reference libraries, maybe to use metabar coding properly, properly. But and I think these, these genomic approaches are the route for the future because they will provide more reliability as, as we were saying with species specific identification. So the, solving those specificity and sensitivity of issues are key. Another question that, that I think will, will arise pretty, pretty soon is, um, how close are we to real estimate abundance, abundance you know, like uh, have quantitative analysis instead of qualitative analysis? I think here the question is how close, how, how well you compare your data to what's already done. And this is something that they, they've highlighted in Europe is that, yes, we might not be perfect but are we getting a signal that is as good as the classical methods? Yeah. So I think often we are. Um, it's just that everyone has this idea that the list has to be perfect. The abundance has to be perfect, but relative read abundance, there are variations, but the overall patterns that we're beginning to see in our diet analyses and things like that are fairly consistent with what's known and providing more information. Um, you obviously need to be cautious. There may be biases, particularly when you're looking across different taxonomic groups and depending on the market choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we did a similar work to, similar to what Hugo did with plants. We did with uh, cod cakes 
in Brazil <laughs> to see what we were uh, getting, you know, from restaurants, from freezing, from supermarkets. And we, we could use, you know, uh, quantitative analysis. We saw that we, we had caught there, but we have a few other species that were less frequent, frequent, frequent found there. But, you know, we, I think we didn't have a comparative analysis to do. We, don't, we, we didn't have a, you know, a control analysis, but it was a proxy for you know, how much cod we had there. So I think that, that's a good example, you know, in, in, as Hugo just uh, showed us with what, plants. What we found, I have a, we have some data that we're working on with tuna cans as well, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. which you're well aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the issues is the, the processing there. So when you're working with food products, some products can be, they, the traces of them can be stronger than other products because of the oiliness of the product. So for example, sardines are very oily versus tuna, which is not so oily. And so the sardine signal can dominate with the amplification because the DNA is more protected during the canning process and things like that. Yeah, that's a that's a problem with the prior bias as well, isn't it? We have we have to make sure that our prior primers are not amplifying more, more one species more than another. So I think the, the good approach to to use is to calibrate our analysis when you use it. So mock communities, you know, to start with mock communities when you start in uh, eDNA analysis or metabarcode analysis. The, just start with mock commits, a good start, you know, to calibrate your analysis in your lab as well. You know, you, sometimes you are just implementing that for the first time in your lab. So just mix a few DNAs there or samples and check if you're detecting everybody. I think that's I think a good start. There's a, there's a few nice comparisons of that with the insect bulk sample uh, studies where they compare sifting, filtering the, the bulk samples by size. And they find that larger insects with, with large exoskeletons, um, the signal varies between the, the different size classes of insect uh, mm -hmm. and the preservation material that they're stored in as well gives a different signal. So there are lots of interesting questions to look at in terms of yeah. how the, the signal changes depending on your sample uh, format and, and subdivision. Mm -hmm. I think Guilherme is already here, isn't he? Yes, Guilherme is here. Dirk is, all, is also here. And the other one is Diego. Is, is Diego is here as well? Guilherme, would, like, would you like to move to the... Is, is, I think there are no more questions. Uh, Jonathan, do, can we move to yep. second round table? Would like to thank Hugo, Jonathan, Quentin. Thank you very much for your thoughts, and I very appreciate, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Nice to have you here with us.